Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Brash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Some people get cynical about the holidays. I can totally understand why. Especially the commercialization of the holiday. You know, every holiday has a hook of some kind, right? Whether it's buying the Easter dress or Easter candy or, you know, Halloween costumes or... You know, also, all Christmas is, has to be the worst offender. You know, a holiday that is... That success is determined by how much crap people buy every single year. Now, I'm not one of those people that says, I'm not going to buy gifts for Christmas. I don't celebrate the holiday. I'm not one of those people. I love to buy and receive gifts under the following condition. I don't do it out of obligation. I don't do it because there's a long list of people that I have to buy for this year. And Jesus, how am I going to get everybody taken care of? Actually, that would be baby Jesus. <laughs> I've got to buy for so-and-so. And if I buy for him, you know, so-and-so is going to be offended if I don't get something for these people over here. And what's the spending limit? I don't know. If I don't spend at least $50, they're going to think I don't care. <laughs> People get worked up. This is a stressful time for a lot of people. Getting up at three in the morning or earlier to wait in line for the next trinket. Got to get it. Got to happen. Oh, I hope they don't run out. Can I put it in layaway? No, I can't afford it now. I tell you what, I'm going to put it in layaway and I've got four weeks to come up with the balance. <laughs> It's stressful for a lot of people. I think it's self-imposed stress in many instances. And maybe I'm oversimplifying. I've always been one of those people that I think I really don't. There's an, one exception where I do buy out of obligation. And let me frame it for you. My family is enormous. We're not Mormon or anything, but I mean, we just have a lot. You've got six kids and they're all having kids. Everybody's having kids. And so the, the family get togethers are major. Just finding a spot to put everybody takes a while. And it's a positive, wonderful experience. And way, way, way back in the day, we used to buy gifts for each other. But when your family's so big, it's, it's logistically nearly impossible to do it. And it's certainly not practical. And it also sucks the joy out of the holiday when you are just running down a laundry list instead of giving with real affection. Well, our solution has been this. We draw names. Now, hang on. That's giving out of obligation. Well, hang on. We turn it around and we do like a dirty Santa thing, right? So you draw a name. And I don't know. I don't know even know if there's a spending cap, but everybody probably keeps it 30 bucks or under 35 and you buy a gift, and it can be a real gift, it can be a funny gift, it can be anything. And you wrap it up and you bring it. And for those who may not know what Dirty Santa is, and there are variations of it, so if how we do it is different than yours, don't freak out. But it's really a lot of fun. You bring it, and you put all the gifts in the center of the room, and you draw a number to see what order the gifts are given or drawn. And you go around and hide. You're number one, Seth. Okay, so I go in. And I open the gift and it is, I don't know, a coffee maker or something for 35 bucks. It's a coffee maker. It's a coffee cup. All right. Oh, I've always wanted this. I had no idea what I was getting. It could have been anything. It could have been a Barbie and Ken set. It could have been a, a car part. It could have been a DVD or Blu-ray. It could be anything. 
So I've got this. Well, as they go down the row, as other people go and get their gifts, they have the choice. They can take the one that they picked off the floor. Remember, they're all wraps, so you don't know what they are. You can just see the shapes of the wraps. You can either hang on to it or you can steal a gift from somebody else. And once a gift is stolen three different times, then it's frozen. So after the third steal, if you're the person who stole it that third, third time, it's yours, period. And it, it may sound kind of dorky. <laughs> it may sound kind of lame. It's fun because it used to be gift cards. Oh, look, it's a Walmart gift card for $25. Thank you so much. Thank you. Big hug, pat, 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 kiss. Okay, who's next? Best Buy gift card. Oh, that's wonderful. $30 Best Buy gift card. Thank you so much. Big kiss, big hug, pat, pat, pat. Oh, look, it's a Bed Bath & Beyond gift card. I mean, there was no magic at all. And very little interaction. It's just it's just the nature of the beast. So we this was our solution. And honestly, we have more fun and we have more laughter <laughs> passing stuff around. Here's a great example of what happened. I, this isn't a Christmas show, but I was just thinking about the holidays and the cynicism about the holidays and how you overcome. I um, I brought last year. I got the Mythbusters bobbleheads. I'm a huge Mythbusters fan. Love it. Love that show. I want to be a Mythbuster. Natalie always kind of winks at me and says, baby, you are one. <laughs> so I guess if my role here functions, but it's I don't get to blow shit up. I just, come on. I want to be a Mythbuster. So um, I got the bobbleheads. I got them from Discovery's website. I love them. But I, I, I threw them in the middle because I thought they'd be an awesome gift because I knew it was a popular show in my family. Before the night's over, we're passing those things around along with I don't know how many other gifts were going on. And a plush blanket and there's an appliance and somebody had a toy guitar, battery powered electric guitar. And somebody else had per perfume and bath bubbles and whatever else. They're all being passed around. And... At the end of the day, I had the last pick and I went, I'm guilty. Went back and picked up those Mythbusters bobbleheads. <laughs> they're, they're, I, I took them back, people. And they're in my office today. And you can have them when you pry them out of my cold, dead fingers. That's our solution for trying to change it up a little bit to do something different. Because by and large, it... It can be easily a stressful time. Thanksgiving is in a few days. I'm not one of those people who's like, we don't celebrate Thanksgiving because of all the bloodshed that happened way back in the day. Well, you know, I was born in 1968. All right. I'm not carrying the guilt, the collective guilt of, I don't know, I, people 200 some years ago. <laughs> you know, I think it's important to acknowledge real history and, and far beyond the what they taught us in elementary school. And we all remember doing those crafts here in the United States of America. You have craft day and you, you take the little cardboard pieces and you make a turkey and then you make your pilgrim hat and you show all of the, uh, the people who'd gotten off the boat, you know, from Europeans sit here and, and, and here they're in the new world. And we sit down at the table with the native Americans and everybody sings Kumbaya. And, and look, now we have America. <laughs> we, that's how they teach it to young children. Right? Well, I know it's not like that. that me people who do, who do any sort of reading at all realize that there are some dark days in the history of any nation. But I'm not going to care. I'm not going to sit around all day and go, I just eschew and reject the whole thing. I don't want anything to do with it because it's covered in blood. I don't I don't go there. And, you know, if you do, fine, that's your choice. Me, I think, number one, I appreciate the time away from work and the time to be with my family. You know, Natalie's in school. I've got a full-time job plus this with kids. Trust me, time together, time off, time to reboot, time to sit around the table and laugh and connect and just be together is precious. We love it. Secondly, I think you should always take advantage of every opportunity to be reminded to be thankful. And I know it's a cliche. I'm just so thankful for so-and-so, and I'm thankful for this, and I'm thankful for all of our many blessings. We've all heard those. I don't mean uh, that saccharine, paper-thin, bumper-sticker kind of gratitude. I mean, every day of the year, we should all stop and think about the things that we have that we consider to be the elements that, that make our life richer, the people that we care about, 
you know, the, the good fortune that we've had. Uh, and that can be, that can come in any form. Everybody's life is very, very different. And so you find what those are to you. But I think a life without gratitude is empty. You, to, it's, it's healthy, I think, to, to stop and take stock and go, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I am thankful. I'm not thankful to any deity, by the way, but I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for, for Natalie. I'm thankful for, for the kids. I'm thankful for the, for the home that we, we bought and sort of built together. I'm, I'm thankful for uh, the people I work with. I'm thankful for the people in the, in the thinking atheist community who've been my second family for the opportunity to have the freedom to do what I do. You know, I just posted a video about uh, a young girl named Malala who was been in the headlines for about five weeks. A girl in Pakistan who was doing what you and I do every day and take for granted. She was saying, I want to go to school. <laughs> she thinks girls should be able to go to school. And she spoke without fear. And the Taliban targeted her for assassination. You know, to live in a free nation... I'm thankful. My heart goes out to, to Malala and all of the people like her. Their very cultures are designed to sort of push you into a, a box to shroud you in fear. I read a headline. I, I wish I'd printed it and brought the details here, but somebody in, um, I believe it was a Middle Eastern country, liked a certain Facebook page and they were arrested for it. You know, we've got so much free speech in this country. We're almost suffocating on it, for Pete's sake. I'm thankful. I'm, I live in a culture where I can speak an unpopular opinion. I can produce videos with sometimes unpopular messages, and I am free to do so. And I think that we should all take stock. I love turkey and gravy and mashed potatoes, and I love... Love pumpkin pie, pumpkin bread, pumpkin cake, pumpkin coffee, pumpkin everything. This is my time of year. It's my time of year, people. Holidays can be stressful because of family. Something that's supposed to bring joy into our lives, right? But... When you are a non-believer and you find yourself in an environment where everybody's giving thanks to God for their many blessings, it can get a little weird. There have been occasions where many of us will be in a circumstance where the meal has been prepared and everybody's about to eat and enjoy. And someone says, wait, 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 hang on, hang on. No, no, no. We need to pray. We got we to pray. We got to pray. We got to pray. Time to pray, everybody. So we all get up and everybody walks around to the area and who's going to pray? So we look around and we find whoever the designated prayer is. And I can tell you right now, it ain't me. But I, I feel a little self-conscious because I am literally the only one there who thinks it's all a bunch of crap. Dear Lord, we thank you for this food. Thank you for this time to be together, Lord. I thank you for the many blessings that you provided that only you can provide. We hope that you will lie, guide and, and lead us and, and direct us in our lives. And we pray that the new year will bring even greater things. And of course, under their breath, now this may be the conspiracy freak in me, under their breath, they're thinking, and please let that little SOB over there, atheist. <laughs> <laughs> to turn from his wicked ways. Uh, no, that's not what they're thinking. But I mean, sometimes you feel that way. You almost feel like it's a performance and you are the only one in the audience. Dear Lord, bless this food. We know that all good things come from you. Nothing else is responsible for the wonderful things that come into our lives. No, we don't do it for ourselves. Jesus, we know it's you. I mean, the whole time you're sitting going, all right, I get it already. Just say amen because I want some pie. Some people... Their non-belief or whatever may determine whether or not they even bother, whether or not they even take the trip. I mean, 
mean, I've, I've had moments of tension in my life, sure, but right now things are pretty good. Everybody's extending the olive branch. I'm really honestly looking forward to it. They're all religious. I love them with all my heart. I'm looking forward to spending the day with them. I know, I just know that they're not going to do what some people have done, right, to non-believers, to put them on the spot and say, <clears throat> hey, Seth, would you please lead us in, the, in saying grace today? I've heard of that being done. That pisses me off. That, honestly, that's almost cause to walk, to do that, to put you in that position in front of everybody, right? Because that is essentially a, it's a way to, number one, look superior, two, to shame you and make you uncomfortable. I'm sorry, that's not what family does. My family would never do that to me. It's just going to be a day where we spend all together. But there are some, some people who, it's going to be so thick. It's going to be so thick. They're going to be waiting for it. Who's going to be the first to make an aside, to make a comment? Who's going to be the first to come over and give me that condescending look and say, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you. And I just want you to know how thankful I am for you. And, and, that, uh, and that Jesus, I mean, you may not realize this, but Jesus loves you so much. And I'm just thankful that Jesus died on the cross for you. I just wanted you to know that I'm not trying to get into a debate or an argument right now. I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk. I just want to send my little condescending message of religion, a little platitude for you. And then I'm going to go off and do my thing. Okay. You just want to kick him in the junk for Pete's sake. This Thanksgiving. I'm trying to enjoy myself. <laughs> Actually, if they talk up here like this, they probably don't have any junk. But I'm just saying that's how you feel. So we're talking about the, the element during the Thanksgiving and, and the Christmas holiday, almost any gathering where you feel like it's the elephant in the room, your non-belief is kind of a problem for some people. Do you want to go and show up and do your thing? If they want to pray over the meal, knock yourself out. I might even bow my head halfway respectfully and just kind of wait till it's over. I'm not there to stir up anything. I'm in your house. It's all good. Got to choose your battles. All right. It's it is what it is. Everybody knows how I feel. But under the surface, you know, you just waiting. you're waiting for the spark that ignites the wildfire and then everything goes straight to hell. How do you get past it? What are your strategies for the holidays? What do you do maybe traditionally that sort of helps circumvent that or avoid it or overcome it? How do you deal with family? Do you have a circumstance you want to talk about in the past where maybe you've been put on the spot? How did you deal with it? Were you singled out to say grace, even though everybody in the place knew that you didn't believe? How did you handle it? What happened? Did you always feel conscious that something may go wrong at any moment? The car may go off the road into the ditch at any second, and it sort of stole the joy of being there. Or was it all good? And you figured it out and you had a great time and it is what it is, as I say. I'd be curious to hear your perspective on that. And we'll start with the perspective from my caller at 318 on the switchboard. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. What's your name? That would be Cody. Hi. Are you a fan of Thanksgiving? Do you participate? Do you celebrate with family? What? Well, to be honest, Thanksgiving, I really don't like because of, you know, the whole Indian thing. We do celebrate it a little bit, but mostly it's just eating. We don't really do much uh, religious stuff on Thanksgiving, but when you get to Christmas, that's when it starts really getting irritating. You know what I mean? Like irritating not, how? Like, what happens? For one, my um, my grandma likes to give me a big, huge argument every Christmas because I'm an atheist. Every single Christmas, it gets tiring very quickly. Like you, you can't properly appreciate the season because you don't believe? Or what kind of stuff yeah, she's throwing at you? the general stuff that you would expect. You really can't celebrate Christmas because of it. You can't do this. You can't do that because you're not a Christian. And I finally got her to understand the other day that this is a story that you might like. I finally got her to understand the other day that it doesn't matter because Christmas is the only time period that most cultures actually have a holiday for. If you look back far enough, it's not a Christian holiday in the national sense. It's just called Christmas because that's the most recent. Anything else for me before I move on, my friend? No, have a happy holidays. I will certainly do <laughs> See so. See you later. All right, take care of yourself. Thanks for calling. Uh, do you say Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays? I say Merry Christmas because 
That's what we call it. I don't get all busted up over whether or not you, you call it Christmas. We're going to do, by the way, next Tuesday night, a show called uh, The Christ Who Stole Christmas. And we are going to talk in depth about the Christmas traditions that everybody's already starting to get their panties and water about, right? Put Christ back in Christmas. Uh, Pat Robertson was on the 700 Club this week, and he's already talking about those atheists and the war on Christmas. And every December, we have to endure the war on Christmas, and they want to take Christ out of Christmas, and they want to take the nativity scenes out of our government institutions. This is one nation under God. And of course, anybody who had taken even a tertiary glance at the history of Christmas would realize that most of the people who are celebrating the Christ child have decorated their celebration with icons that are distinctly and verifiably pagan. It's awesome. You walk in and they're like, keep Christ in Christmas. And you see the Christmas tree and you go, uh-huh. <laughs> you sing Christmas carols? Uh-huh. Mistletoe. Oh, that's Christian. We're going to talk about a lot of those things in depth. And in, in advance of that... On Thursday, Thanksgiving Day here on the 22nd of this month, um, I'm going to release a video called Put the X... Is it Put the X Back in Xmas? <laughs> I, just, I just drew a blank. Oh, it's to Xmas and beyond. And um, it's a video that I released last year, but there were a few things that I said, I just said poorly. Uh, they were just not... They weren't well defended. They were, the points were there, but they weren't well defended. And as good science does, it revises itself whenever it is incorrect and wherever it's weak. And I thought I need to go back and fix it. So I went back and I um, completely sort of took a, a fresh look at it, made a couple of tweaks, freshened it up for you, and it will release on Thursday, and it will address a lot of the, and it's fun. It's a fun little six minute video that talks about, it starts with the traditions of Christmas. We go through everything from where did Yule logs come from, you know, and, and Yule tide and, and, and we talk about uh, the Christmas tree and evergreens. And we talk about, um, uh, how, why they came up with December 25th. For the birthday of Jesus, the sun. It wasn't actually a sun, but the sun in the sky, uh, at least for some cultures. There's a lot of very cool stuff in there. And then the last half of the video goes into the actual biblical account of the Christ child, the nativity story. Now, as Bart Ehrman has often said, people don't read the Bible parallel to itself. In other words, you don't pull up the book of Matthew when you read it next to the book of Luke. You don't read them side by side. That's not how people are trained to read scripture. They read one story and then they're all done and then they flip over to the next book and they read. But comparing side by side is something that's quite simply, and I think on purpose, they do not train believers to do. So what we do is we take a look at the Jesus story, the nativity story, the birth of Christ story, the story that everybody's all flipped out about here in the month of December. Or it's not quite December, but here they will be in the month of December. And we take a look at it and we dissect the inconsistencies, the problems with the Jesus story. No, he wasn't born December 25th. After his birth, one chapter says he went here. The other chapter says he went here. One chapter says there was a decree by Herod to kill the firstborn. The other one says absolutely doesn't even mention Herod like it doesn't even exist. The lineage of Christ is jacked up. One, the book of Matthew has, I don't know how many books, 41, I think. I'm doing it from memory. I think uh, Luke has 25. And we just sort of go boom, 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 all the way down these bullet points. And, uh, and it's, it's an interesting look at, at the holiday in a digestible form. And do I think Christians are going to receive the information? No. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it's sourced. It doesn't matter that in the age of information, you can actually check what we say. And you can go take a look and educate yourself and do your own homework and validate those claims or refute them. No, it doesn't make any difference. I think people hold on to Christmas like they, you know, they, the more you challenge it, the more they grasp onto it. They circle the wagons. No, no, no. Mm -mm. Keep the Christ in Christmas. But that video releases in two days. 
just in time for the Christmas season. So if anybody goes on your Facebook page, and there's a good chance it may happen, at least here in the United States, where they say, put Christ back in Christmas, and they talk about Xmas, X-M-A-S. They have crossed the Christ out of Christmas. (laughs) And you can just immediately say, no, that's not true. And you can tell them why. It'll all be in the video. Releases here in a couple of days. Back to the phones. Let's talk to 661. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Thanks for waiting. Who's this? Hi, I'm Diana. Um, The way I look at it personally is that at least Thanksgiving, I'm trying right now to build my worldview as appreciation rather than thanks. Because as soon as you say thanks, that deity pops up. And being an atheist, I'm not too good about that. Rather, I like to look at it as here is my universe. Here is my world. I am in it. There are good things here, and they have value. If there is someone responsible for those things being there, I can thank them. If there is no one responsible, for example, the beauty of a sunrise, There's no person responsible for that. I can simply appreciate that. And I can find the beauty, the value in it. And as far as Christmas is concerned, that's another solstice holiday. I'm Saturnalia, the whole bit. They put the Christ back in Christmas, police. I believe the fourth century church put the Christ in Christmas. Do you hear Um, a lot from people who are talking about lamenting the death of the holiday or the or the, the ripping Jesus out of, out of his own birthday kind of a thing. Do you hear a lot of that in your circle? Quite a bit. I live in a, um, I like to call it a Christian theocracy. I'm in one of the small boroughs near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it's very, very Catholic here. The um, Eastern Europeans who are left over from having worked in the mills were very staunchly Catholic, and nominally Catholic, as far as I am concerned, very few of them actually lived what they believed. They simply did it because their parents did it and told them to do it. And yeah, it's not easy, downright impossible, in fact, to convince these people that I'm not the one with the wrong idea. Yeah. <laughs> like I say, it's a selfish holiday, the return of the light. This is where the Christmas lights come from. So, guys, you know, leave me alone on this. I'm celebrating it in my own way, but yeah, it's, it's not easy. Back to the Thanksgiving, the appreciation. My life has gone through a bit of an upheaval in the last year, and it's really time for me to sit back and think about what I do have and what value it has, rather than thanking some guy on the clouds, just taking it in and saying, this is a good thing, and my life is better for it. Part of the upheaval, it was a year ago. Then my parents wrote me off because they didn't like my wardrobe. I am transsexual. And it reminds me, how much do I have to give thanks for? (laughs) And one can get bitter about that. But I'm trying to not do that. I'm trying to look at the Thanksgiving, look at the appreciation of what there is. Do you spend the holidays no with your family? Do you spend time together? Or is there is the cord completely been cut? I am totally cut off. So who's your family? Uh, I, I mean, if you were to spend time with someone on Thursday, tell me you've got some people that you can lean on. I'm hoping to visit a very good friend close by here, stop by on Thursday, And she and her husband are absolutely wonderful people. They have known me for 20 years, before, during, and after my transition, and absolutely love the whole bit of it. it, Yeah, and when when I first told them about this, they said, yeah, tell us something we didn't know already. Um, They knew before I did. Um, And yes, with them, I can have a wonderful, wonderful time. I always do. Very few people do I have, but they are gems, absolute gems. And there is someone in Dayton I I talk to. I've never seen her face. She's a wonderful person though, just by um, 
the correspondence we have um, via email, via Facebook. She even <laughs> she even sent me a hot plate because where I'm living right now, the conditions are I call them Neanderthal, and um, it's difficult for me to cook because I I lost my appliances when I came here and. All of a sudden, there's this hot plate on my on my doorstep, and it's like, oh my! It's not that I'm worth anything. Why did you do this for me? And there is another approach, and she is someone I can thank personally. But even the fact that she is there is is something of great great value. It's funny how the things that are the most valuable to people, when when we stop and think about it, are not all the crap we buy it at the store (laughs) you know really when it comes down to the things of our in our life that bring value the trinkets they they blow away in the dust pretty quickly and we realize what's truly important and those truly important things unfortunately seem to be the things that most people take for granted yeah they are there they are supposed to be there they are supposed to be there for me but really think about it Think about what value that does have. What would your life be without that? Because it can happen. Well, I know um, family comes in many forms. Well, I don't know the specifics of your story, but I can tell you right now that, you know, compassion and support are not the domain of the religious. And on the thinking atheist community, and I know throughout our culture, all you have to do is look these days and you can find people who get you who get your circumstance. So for what it's worth, just know that you're not by yourself out there, my friend. I am finding that. I'm not alone. My hope is, too, is that as we see the the fight for reason and for equality and for human rights and for all of these things that are happening far too late, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. here, in, here in, 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 especially here in certain parts of the United States, my hope is that in the future, that circumstances like this will not be the oppressive uh, things that unfortunately they are today. I mean, I, I would like to see you spend the holidays with some joy and, and around the people who, who accept you for who you are, who don't try to cram you into their cookie cutter and, and who celebrate all the wonderful things that you bring to the table. I mean, I think wouldn't it be nice if we could all take off our God glasses and all, all our moral superiority glasses and begin to understand that people are who they are and. And it's okay to be different. It's okay to be different than me. I'm not threatened by it. You shouldn't be threatened by me. I'm not threatened by you. You and I just met, and it sounds like we're already on the same page. Definitely. If, if I may, really quickly, though, our conversation now is leading into some thought that I had had a little bit off topic as far as this goes. But when I am looking at the, um, the atheist material that is out there, I see a lot about what we don't believe. Am I missing something or am I not seeing about the things we do believe? You know, if I, I, if I may have your permission, I think what I'll do, is I, I have an opinion on this. I can give you just one guy's perspective. Let me do it off the air here real quick and, and you can just take it or leave it. <laughs> you know, it may be pearls okay. of wisdom or it may be like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But let yeah. me kind of give you what I got and, and we'll see if it's something that might maybe draw a circle around the answer to your question. OK, sure. My friend, I hope uh, the holidays are good to you, and I'm glad you called, and it means a lot that you're part of the community, okay? I'm glad I got through to you, and thank you, Seth, for being here. Really, you are a voice in the darkness, and I cannot wait until your book comes out because it will be part of my library. Well, I, I want your perspective on what you went through. Well, keep your, keep your expectations, you know, right about here. <laughs> it's just, it's just, <laughs> what, you know, don't, just go easy there, buddy. You know, I'm going to give you what I got. Hopefully, hopefully it will be a, it'll be worth your time. And I appreciate you so much. You take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Seth. I was talking to uh, Thunderfoot, I guess it was a year and a half ago. And he doesn't use really the word atheist when he brands himself. He calls himself a rationalist. And it's it's really it's a valid point in that he calls himself a rationalist because it is a proactive term that defines what he is about and not what he isn't like atheist. I do not believe in any God. Well, that question then leads to the question that comes up is, well, what do you believe in? 
And I think a lot of the reason that, I don't know about you, but a lot of the reason that I spend a lot of time with the rock hammer chipping away at what I don't buy is because there's so much stuff out there that's being sold <laughs> to impressionable people. Robert Green Ingersoll used to say, the more false we destroy, the more room we make for the true. Well, we have to have room for the true. You're going to have to debunk the crap information out there. You're going to have to go and do battle with superstition, with crazy thinking, with lazy thinking, with bad history, false history. We are going to have to go and undo it. And of course, when you do that, then it's easy for people to paint us as the miscreants. We're miserable. All we are is negative. All they do is talk about no, no, no. Well, we, the reason that we do that is because if you come to me and you tell me that the Grand Canyon was created in five minutes, when God decided he wanted to drown everybody, except for a guy who was 600 years old, who then practiced incest with his wife and his children, <laughs> and that was 4,000 years ago. I mean, I, I have to address the fact that this is demonstrably wrong. Now, I know it's a negative thing to come at you and say this is bogus. But I think he's got a good point. We probably can always do a better job of celebrating what we are about. You know, I'm about being curious and rediscovering the world every day. I'm excited to learn something new every day. Somebody told me once that superstition's been selling the same old stuff for thousands of years. It hasn't, the Bible hasn't changed. But every day, science gives us something new to talk about. Every day, we learn something new. And then that leads to a thousand more questions that we want to go explore. It's an amazing new way of living. Let's talk about the people who are being set free from superstition. I see those stories all the time. That's why I make the In Your Words videos that just feature the eyes and the faces and the voices of people who got out and they want to encourage other people to say, look, I've been there. I have uh, on the calendar for, I think, early December, a an interview. I'm not, I, I can't give the details yet because we haven't hammered them all out yet, but a, a believer, a Christian who hosts a Christian podcast, contacted me and he said he'd like to have me on his show to talk about how I came to reject Christianity after all those years. Now, of course, I can, <laughs> I've already got my, you know, the skeptic in me is already going, all right, here we go. Here we go. And I still don't know what to expect, but we're working on those you know, specifics of when that's going to happen. And I have uh, received permission to record the entire conversation and play it unedited for you on my show as well. So if you don't want to go to his place to listen, uh, and, and he has my guarantee, and I will hold myself accountable to you and everyone, that uh, our conversation is completely unaltered in any way. What we say is what you'll get. But he said to me in, in our conversation, he said, I just want to see how you could come to be an atheist, seeing that there is a real revival going on in America. Now, I have to be the bad guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I, I have to be, I have to tear down the false to make room for the true. no, Actually, the statistics say that non-belief is the fastest rising demographic in the United States today. And here are the numbers. Well, that makes me a negative person. Well, we can turn that on its ear and also say, you know what? It's the fastest growing demographic in America. People are, people are walking away from the chains of superstitious thinking. They're taking responsibility for themselves. Uh, someone sent me, a, I'm totally off on a tangent. Somebody sent me a, a pen and Teller link 
uh, to one of their shows, one of their bullshit episodes. The name of the show is Bullshit. It's not Bullshit Episode. <laughs> the name of the show is on Showtime. It's called Bullshit. And it's and I really enjoy it. I enjoy Penn and Teller. And they were talking about 12-step programs, right? And how they are essentially indoctrination mechanisms. And they are offensive in the fact that they tell people that they must surrender control to a higher power. Instead, we are in a culture where more and more people, the NRs, the non-religious, are saying, no, I take responsibility for myself. That's something to get excited about. I'd rather focus on human beings than keep my eyes glued to the skies, praying to the air, to my invisible friend. No, I'm going to go where the real solutions are, where the real connections are. That's something to be celebrated. And I think at the end of the day, we should all be reminded, not just on Thanksgiving week, but all the time, we should continue to promote the proactive, the positive, the things to be grateful for, the progress we are making. You know, if all we do is talk about what needs to be done and we never acknowledge the inroads we've made, well, we've missed a huge opportunity. Just to see how the culture has changed in the last decade is encouraging and exciting. Imagine where we'll be in 10 more years. I'm way excited about that. I believe in people. I believe in human beings. I believe in science. I believe in reason. I also believe in the heart. I'm a sentimental guy, but I don't believe that people should live their lives based on emotion or intuition, gut feelings, hairs on the back of their neck. I think emotion can color a life that is already based on science and reason and rationality. And that's a life to be celebrated. I believe in the real world. I believe this life is precious because there is no heaven. There is no hell. I believe that we should maximize every freaking second here because that's all we got. At the end of the day, if there's something that you should say to someone else and you haven't done it, you better do it. If there's a dream you'd like to achieve, put it on your list. Make every effort to do it. This is what we have. We've beaten the odds to be here. This tiny blip on a tiny blip inside a tiny galaxy and inside a vast universe. We've beaten the odds to be here. We better make the most of it. It's an amazing time and a time for which we should be thankful. Had a message in from Dallas. He said, I deconverted from Christianity in July. I'm looking forward to my first Thanksgiving and Christmas as an atheist. Oh, goody. <laughs> You're in for... <laughs> no, actually, I don't know your family, so I don't know exactly how intense that's going to be. I'm really interested in what other atheists have experienced during the holiday season. I'm not sure what to expect from my family. Well, maybe we'll run into this uh, here on the switchboard. Let's talk to 248. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Thanks for waiting. Who's this? 248. <laughs> Two two nine. Who's this? Seth. Seth. Yes. This is Cliff Schrager. Cliff, I'm so glad you called. I'm just glad you made it through. I think you sent me a message earlier today saying you were going to try to be a part of tonight's show. So I'm glad to hear your voice. Yeah. What's going on, yeah. my friend? Well, I'm fascinated by your subject, elephant in the room. Um, it has been uh, a very difficult five years for me. Um, it only got worse when I came out on your program. Your whatever podcast from May 8th of 2011. Now you um, officially came out of the closet. You yeah. said the words, I don't believe. Yes. For the I'm first the program. Time. And I oh, and I received letters from all over the world, very encouraging letters. It was, uh, it was very affirming and uh, I'm glad I was able to do that. But, uh, at, you know, prior to that, our family had been through unbelievable tragedy um, and, the law, our oldest son was blown up on Father's Day in Iraq on 2007, and then less than four months later, our two youngest were on their way to a Christian party, were killed, uh, broadsided out in the inner, out in the country. And I've been a pastor for 25 years, and I didn't uh, lose my faith at that. To console myself, I would dive into some 
hard subject, and I decided to do a, a, an apologetic study on one that had never been resolved, and I found that I could no longer believe what I'd believed. And then when I came out on your program, um, uh, I essentially lost the rest of my family. And um, our family gatherings, usually we, uh, my brother's, my younger brother's a pastor, and they will rent a gymnasium uh, and lots of family show up, all Christians, missionaries, pastors. And um, this year, they won't listen to this, but this year my plan is to not go at all. I'm, I kind of went into a meltdown or so a week or so ago, and I'm staying with some friends in the Grand Rapids area. And... Um, one of my buddies has invited me to go to a Thanksgiving gathering with him because I just can't bear the thought of standing around with this elephant in the room. People, I walk into the room and immediately little clusters start and they look at me sadly. People will come up and hug me and cry and say, we're praying for you. And it just brings, it's like when I walk in, there's a chill that goes over the room because this is, and everyone's grieving over my lost soul. They tell me they love me, but they see me as the guy that's going to hell. And it's just not fun. I mean, it, the turkey tastes good, but I'm not good enough. So you know, this, this speaks to um, an interesting angle that I'm, I'm glad you brought up that just because someone, and, and I don't celebrate in any way the divide between you and your family, it breaks my heart. But there comes a point when just because they are your family and you share the family tree does not mean that you are obligated to put yourself in the crosshairs just because it is a holiday. And Thanks. so you've taken a harder stand and you've said, look, this is over the threshold. It is now a joyless experience it is uncomfortable for everyone. I'm going to do something yep. else. Yep. Thank you. That helps to hear you affirm that because it, I'm nervous about it, but they don't even know I'm not coming yet. Well, I won't. Um, they don't listen to this show, do they? <laughs> no, I hope not. no way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I remember your story vividly, and I think it seems like we spent like 30 minutes on the phone when you called. Um, it, it, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was no, I mean, yeah. it was, uh, it I was on the edge of my seat. I mean, hearing the tremendous amount of loss that you had have had in your life and coming to the point where you are now at, at a point where you really need people to stand with you and stand by you. And oh. instead I have this mental picture of the platitudes and that's kind of smarmy condescending. When someone looks at me and they tell me that they're praying for me in that, oh. in that totally condescending way, it's the, yes. I don't know if they even realize how insulting and superior it they don't. sounds. I don't, I don't think they do. I've said in the past that I would take a good friend over a distant relative any day. And and what I mean by <laughs> that is, what I mean by that is, is I've always held to, you may be on my family tree, but it doesn't mean you're in. It doesn't mean you automatically get uh, a, a piece of the a pie in my life. You don't get to automatically. And I'm, I'm about family. And I know some people who, who are like, you know, they're on the ancestry.com website. You know, they got, they, if you're anywhere on the tree, you're on the farthest branch and the branch is broken. doesn't matter. They'll drive through the state that you live in one day and they can't wait to go knock on your door and reunite with somebody who is a relative. I know people like that. I'm more one of those people where I'm like, you know what? I, I would rather take somebody who's not related, who's a good friend, who gets and supports me, and and their family, and and I don't and know that, if that's popular yep. or not. That's what I'm doing. It's it's the only way I can survive right now. I've got to be with people of like mind, clear thinking, free thinking, non-religious. Yeah. Well, before I forget, um, I was asked if I got on tonight by my good friend Rebecca Hensler to thank you for your program because it was a big impetus for her. She developed the Grief Beyond Belief uh, website, which is designed specifically to help grieving people who are often surrounded by and inundated with uh, the banal platitudes from religious family and friends. And it, the thing has taken off like wildfire. She says, Cliff, if you get on, make sure you tell Seth thank you. So I wanted to pass that on from her. I don't think I did anything. I mean, you're welcome. <laughs> but I don't. Well, no, she 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 listened to you, and it just it it was a big drive for her. Like I've got to get this going for people like Seth and Cliff, who are just pounded by religious idiots, 
and, and especially those who are grieving, who are surrounded by things that don't comfort. And uh, so she's got a wonderful thing going on, and she wanted me to pass that on. Grief but Beyond your, Belief. Your it's, that's exciting. And, and of all oh, the shows I've done, good. I mean, we're up to, this is what, 80, 80, I'm doing the math, 82, 82, you know, 90-minute podcast. That seems to be the grief um, without religion. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Um, grief grief with, Beyond Belief. Uh, it, the that, name of my oh, show just totally slipped my mind. Uh, grieving without show? grief without God, I think is what I called it. That oh, seems okay, to be the yeah. one that has resonated the most with people because grief is sort of a universal thing. And the holidays are hard for many, many people because oh. of that. I'm sure you're going into the Thanksgiving and Christmas holiday and you're never going to forget. Tell me that there's some joyful stuff that, that are going to materialize for you this weekend. My heart breaks to think that that you have you have nothing positive oh. coming up, you know. Well, I've got a I've got a friend in Grand Rapids. Uh, he's a gay buddy. I, I'm straight, but uh, he, I'm he's invited me to go to a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of his gay friends, probably straight friends too, for a time of a Thanksgiving time. But it's non-religious, and I that's where I'm going to go this year. They're wonder. I've been, met his friends. They're wonderful people, and they love me just for me. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that and, and being away from all of the religious bullshit. Well, you so know, if your family my, finds out my... about that, they're going to freak out. I mean, oh, you know, I don't even care because I thought, you know, I did my buddy, Dave, if uh, we would be a great couple if I was gay. <laughs> and so and, and, yeah. and people, you know, people say, well, you chose to be gay. And I want to, I don't even want to post it on Facebook. I've tried to choose to be gay and it doesn't work. I'm just saying, I, yeah. Yeah, look, <laughs> I'm, know, we're I, surrounded by it. We're surrounded by it's, you know, it's, it's uh, not a child. It's, it's a child, not a choice. Uh, it's Adam and Eve, not uh, Adam and Steve. I mean, we live in the uh, bumper sticker platitude culture where no one seeks true understanding. They want to start with the answer in a position of moral superiority and then they just want to live yep. with with their ears plugged for the rest of their life, and and not everybody's like that, but there are enough to make you crazy for sure. Yep. So, yep. my friend, I well, hope you have a the, wonderful Thanksgiving. I really do. I hope you find you some joy much. and and tell your buddies thanks for. Uh, it means a lot to me that they're taking care of you, man. I'm glad to know you're in good Thank hands. You. Thank you, Seth. Good All program. Right. Take care of yourself, Cliff. We'll talk soon. All right. Had a little bit of a delay on my uh, connection there, and I felt like I was talking right over you, man. I'm sorry, Cliff. Forgive me for interrupting if I did. It's, you know, it's <clears throat> the Internet is a little bit of a, a unique place to have a radio show because, you you know, it's all about timing. And sometimes I, I don't hear him reply and I begin to respond. And all of a sudden there's that clash of voices and, I'm, and it just kills momentum. And I feel like I'm. Totally rude. Sorry. Sorry about that, Cliff. Two, four, eight. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hi. Uh, hi. This is Rochelle. Rochelle. How are you? I'm yeah. doing well. What's um, going on in your world? Oh, sorry. I was driving. I need to pull up. Um, well, this is the first, um, my first Thanksgiving and holidays as a non-believer. Um, and uh, I, uh, I am so grateful for your show, by the way. I admire you so much. Um, I was in... The Colorado at Denver at the conference that I met you. I don't know if you remember. You probably don't. You meet so many people, but um, I went there and kind of just felt great to like be around people that you know um, are atheists. And because I don't have any friends like that, I don't. Ha all my friends are believers and in laws are Catholic. And I was brought up in a Pentecostal church and home so you had driven what like two or three hours to be there to the ascent of atheism event is that right no i i flew from michigan okay i've got i've got you confused uh -huh. forgive me Rochelle. That's okay that's okay yeah i flew from michigan by myself to go and um i ended up meeting a friend that used to live in my town in michigan and her and i became really good friends she was um registering and she overheard me talking and where i was you know heard where i was from and she's um, she actually, we became really good friends. She kind of like took me under her wing. She's been an atheist her whole life and she was intrigued by my story. And I was, you know, really interested on, about her story. And she ended up flying here for the Tigers World Series and staying with me and go, going to the game. And um, so it was really, it was a great experience. But this is 
going to be interesting, I have to say. Um, with well, do the, they know? They, Are they aware? No, not really. I think my parents know that I went to the convention in Colorado, but they didn't. I didn't really tell them a lot of what it was about. I just said it was a convention about, and I was, I don't know. I think they think I'm just trying to find my way, but they did. I went to um, Kentucky. To, I drove down to go to the convention in the university there in Lexington, October 6th. I drove down on the 5th, but I didn't make it to the convention on um, that Saturday because I ended up, it was, it's a really, really crazy story, but I was in the emergency room all day, so I didn't, I didn't end up seeing you, but I was there to, you know, show my support. I had your t-shirt on. But, um, <laughs> well, thank I, you. <laughs> it Thanks was, for coming. But, um, yeah, but well... It's a crazy story. I was treated really badly at the emergency room there. But um, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm all over the place. <laughs> That's all right. Follow my voice. All right. Follow my I... voice. All right. Come back to the light, Rochelle. I know. I'm, I'm so, all over the map here. <laughs> so you come from a you come from a Sunday go to meet in Pentecostal background. Your family, yeah. you anticipate yeah. what? If if it comes out that you are well, a non-believer, does, does it get crazy or, or what? It doesn't. It doesn't get crazy, but it is like that uncomfortable. Um, there's a, you know, my, my father will say a prayer before dinner, and I know that he will, he always puts an underlying message like, and please let my children find you and have a personal relationship, you know, um, find their way back. They think that I'm kind of like finding my own salvation right now, which is very, like you said, undermining. Like, I don't get it. Um, I don't think it's going to be bad. I just think it'll be, maybe it'll be more uncomfortable for me because it's only been a year from the the huge shift in my life. You know, there are some people though, I think that go into an, like, I don't catch this from you and I may be wrong, but some people will walk into an event like that where everybody's a believer, but them, and they're going Mm -hmm. to pray Mm -hmm. and people are invoking God and they're ready to go. They're Mm -hmm. ready to go. You know, they're ready to hit the mat and, and, and just, and they have a fight about it. And I honestly think, I'm not going to, you know, you really do have to choose your battles. Do you want your Thanksgiving memory to be you guys oh, going no. 15 rounds over an issue that no. no one's going to get resolution on anyway, as long as they don't overstep boundaries, true boundaries. Right. Uh, I, I tend to think you just hang back, enjoy the meal, you smile and wave and oh. put up, put up with the asides, a few asides. It's just going to happen, you know? Oh, yeah. And I agree. I agree with that. I just, um, I don't know. I haven't really come out and said I'm an atheist. I just kind of have said, you know, I'm not, I do not believe in the God of my childhood, you know, and I think um, eventually they're, you know, it's going to come to fruition, but that's as of right hardcore. now, no, I would not. Yeah. No, that's hardcore <laughs> for Pentecostals. And you know, the Pentecostal, uh, you know, this as well as anybody, they believe you can lose your salvation where like yeah. some in like the Baptist faith and some others will say the once saved, always saved. You got to, you're already in and you can, you can then do anything and you're safe. But in the assembly of God and the Pentecostal faith, they, they believe that what you're doing will now cost you heaven. And that's pretty hardcore. Yeah, it is. It's definitely um, been kind of a, uh, a feel, you know, a feeling of like, I, I know it's not, I don't think they're real places anymore, but I still have that, you know, anxiety feeling. I've been doing research on um, with a religious trauma, <laughs> you know, kind of doing my homework, trying to find out if people, you know, how this really like affects them psychologically, because it is difficult. I mean, I wouldn't have it other way, any other way now. I love my new understanding of the world and I, I it's so much it's a lot better, but it's still, you know, embedded in me. I'm 36. I mean, I was, uh, you know, I received the Holy Ghost. I was baptized at the age of seven with the tactic fear, you know, the videos of the Mark of the Beast and all that crazy hellish stuff. It was, and I did the, you know, like the Jesus, Jesus pants in the summer. So it is, it's still, I'm, I'm still going through the process. Seven years but, old. Um, Rochelle, you remind yeah. me of that. You know, I, I read a, a portion of the first chapter of the book that's coming out in January where we talk about the age of accountability and how at the age of, for you, seven, you were expected okay. to comprehend and deal with accountability for your own inherited sin nature mm-hmm. <laughs> and then receive the deity <laughs> from abo- above. And when you look at it objectively from the outside in now and you look mm-hmm. at yourself at seven, 
you must shake your head and go, man, I don't know what I was doing. I was seven. Does that go through your I head? I know. Oh, absolutely. I just, I remember that fear of just being scared. I'm like, I don't want to go there. So I just threw my hands up in the air, you know, and just prayed to exhaustion. I'll never forget that night. And just, you know, was it's, it's very scary. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll never forget that. And it's, it's very, the church that I went to had a um, Easter play every year where they did the whole reenactment of Jesus and the cross and being beaten. And I remember every, you know, um, Easter going to that. And that was scary. I mean, that makes you feel like responsible for his death. And, you know, it was, it was quite, um, I mean, you know, Pentecost, I mean, it's pretty fundamentalist. It's It's, guilt (laughs) porn. It's guilt guilt. porn. It's what they do. Look, they, they tell you that you are ill, you're sick, you're contaminated. And then they sell us, they sell you the cure. And um, mm-hmm. if I may, and I, you don't have to share anything you're not comfortable with, but you brought something up that I'd like to maybe cover in the new year. You mentioned mm-hmm. trauma. Do you feel even now kind of an under the surface fear? What if I got it wrong? I don't want to go to hell. Uh, it, I mean, do you have some of those things or something else that's sort of rattled your cage even now? Um. You know, it's getting easier. Well, not so much. Well, I'll think of that, but then I just um, redirect my thought and say, no, that is not it. And then I'll list, list you know, I'll start reading. Um, Dan B- uh, Barker, I love his books, you know, and I'll just, you know, read or I'll listen to one of your shows and just kind of confirm that I am in the right place now. This is, you know, the way I'm thinking. It's just you know, being told so long that when you start questioning that that's the adversary, you know, putting thoughts in your mind to trying to distract you from God, it's hard not to get a little bit of like, ooh. <laughs> we have so we have a lot in common. I mean, I don't know if it's because we're, it's, we're both from the States or, or both from conservative homes, but the whole, I, I'm not sure I believe this. Oh, wait, that's just the devil. I, it totally resonates with me. I, I heard it all. Those are just right. the whispers of doubt. It's it's right. the evil one kind of deal. What about the holidays for you? Do you celebrate Thanksgiving? I mean, yeah. I, I know you celebrate with your family, but do you, I mean, do you get into it? Do you connect with the holidays? Do you, what, what's your take? Oh, well, I love the holidays. I mean, it, of course, this year, it'll be a little bit different. You know, it, it's not, I think it was, in between Thanksgiving and Christmas is when I ran across your video, Welcome to This World. So that's when I started to do, you know, go through this process. But I, yeah, I'm excited for the holidays. I think everything is going to be fine. I love Christmas or winter solstice or whatever people call it. I call <laughs> I mean, it Christmas. I mean, I, I do too. am I, I wrong for out. that? <laughs> I, I don't, I just don't flip out. You're asking a newbie. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I don't think <laughs> It, it's it's the cultural name for the holiday, I know. and that's it why I go there. I think it's you actually you almost and I get holidays. I get that, but happy mm-hmm. you know happy non specific winter solstice event where we exchange gifts yeah. does not have the same ring for me it's, as oh, Christmas. Yeah. So, right. well, I'm thankful but, for you, young lady. I'm glad that uh, uh, I'm glad you called the show. show. Great. Yeah, thank you. I'm so glad I got through. I wasn't quite sure if I was or not, but yeah. Thank you, and uh-huh. um, take care. And uh, oh, one more thing. Sorry, I don't want to keep you. Um, the I need to do another uh, convention since the last one I didn't make it to. But the Lexington Free Thought. Are you going to be there? The now, one, the, one, the one in sorry, Lexington, one in Kentucky, Texas. is already over with. Um, no, the one in Texas, Austin, in March. Oh, uh, I'll be there. I'm not on the speaking roster, but I'm going to have a table, and I'm I'm going to go oh, just okay. attend and soak everything up. So how is that? Is that like a, is that in the past, have you gone to that before it's been? I have done the, I did the American Atheist Convention after the Reason Rally, and it was amazing. Um, they always have an amazing uh, lineup of speakers. And this year, this 2013 event, which is in March, is mm-hmm. their 50 an- year anniversary. And what's happened was oh, okay. they, they started in Austin 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. So they're sort of going back to their roots. 
and they've got a bunch of big names on the on the roster and a, and a bunch of people who are amazing thinkers and have great messages and have been great champions for free thought. And I mean, I'm there. And uh, so I would encourage anybody else if you uh, trust me, I'm not on I'm not a shill for the American atheist. I just think they they, they yeah. do good work and it's going to be an amazing convention. And I'm looking forward to meeting everybody there. So it'll, it'll be a major okay. event in March. And I think uh, okay. if you just go to atheist.org, I think all the infos are there. OK. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. All right. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. You You take care, Rochelle. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. All right. See what I mean? I feel like I'm talking over it, right over them. And I'm, I'm not sure. Is that me? Is it, have, have I lost my timing? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> have I lost it? I don't mean to be rude. Uh, I had a message in from Jack. He said, I always find it interesting and slightly entertaining when it comes time to say what you're thankful for on Thanksgiving. Some people will be thankful to have a loving family or thankful to be gathered around with friends and relatives for a delicious meal. Or simply to be alive. All great, honest things to be thankful for. What I find ridiculous are the ones that feel the need to thank God for giving us this great meal. Or allowing us to be here on this earth today and such things. It almost makes me feel like standing up and smacking some scent into the person. But since it's Thanksgiving, I prefer to avoid arguments and enjoy the day. And thank, instead of thanking a magical sky man on Thanksgiving, I instead think about how amazing it is to be the product of a four billion years of evolutionary success. The chances of our existence never cease to amaze me. No God Involved. Here's the one I always hear at the at the Thanksgiving table or or at almost any meal. Lord, we ask that you bless this food. Nourish it to our bodies. And our bodies to your service. And the whole time I'm even when I was a believer, I remember thinking of that prayer. I'm like, doesn't isn't the nourishment factor sort of already predetermined by the ingredients that you're putting in your mouth? I mean, how exactly does God nourish the food to your body? If you were a non-believer and you ate the same stuff, you'd have the same result, right? <laughs> nourish this food to our bodies as we commit our bodies to your service. Rachel sent me a message and said there was a very large elephant in the room a month or so ago. My grandparents are Catholic. And they're trying to expel the atheism out of me. They took me to a cathedral in the middle of the city where I live to see a saint's severed hand. Obviously, no joke here. A real severed hand cut from the elbow with flesh and bone still attached. Rachel, where do you live? With all the religious people and priests calling it a wondrous miracle and a blessing. It was enclosed in glass, but it was just very, very disturbing that everybody was praising this severed hand. The worst part of the whole ordeal was my grandparents were cursing me for recoiling at this thing, telling me it's holy. Ever since then, they've been obsessed with talking about my lack of faith amongst their friends and how I wasn't going to worship a dead saint's hand. And every time I walk into a room, they stop talking to me and just stare until I leave. How can I deal with this? Well, I can't. I don't know. Honestly, I honestly think our approach can't be about others as much as it is ourselves. And I'm no expert. But, you know, I'm about boundaries, right? There's a boundary. And if you cross it, now it's on. But I see... Not just a desire to rescue me from hell. When I go in and people do the thing where they hush, and they, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't get a lot of that with family. With my family, it's more like, you know, boy, look at this beautiful weather the Lord's made. That kind of stuff where they're talking to other people and I happen to be in the zip code where they're talking. <laughs> oh, I went out and saw this scenery. I thought, oh, the Lord is good. You know, those kind of things. Well, that's that's designed for my ears. I get that. Whatever. I'm not going to I'm not going to flip out over it. But I think beyond people who are um, simply wanting to rescue you, genuinely rescue you from hell because they are concerned. I think I think it masks an insecurity. What kind of person can't be in the room with somebody who disagrees with them? And this is true with atheists as well. You know why when we are in a room with someone who has an opposing viewpoint and we can't take it, we can't sit still, we can't hold our tongue, we can't stop vibrating, you know, got to you got to say something. You can't temper yourself. Well, many, many times, not always, I think many times it speaks to to an insecurity or a lack of maturity and discipline. 
I mean, you have to choose your battles. And when you go into an event like this or a circumstance like this and you have someone who simply won't let it go, I honestly think in many occasions they are speaking to their own lack of conviction on the issue. They got to change your mind because there's strength in numbers. And if everybody believes like they believe, then they got to be right. While you're a holdout, wait a minute, there's a chance for doubt. Doubt's a sin. There's a chance for something to chip away at the cocoon that they live in. No, 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 I want everybody around me to think exactly the way I do, and I won't rest until they do. I think there's a lot of insecurity. That's a guess, but it's an educated one. 218, thanks for waiting. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? This is Leah. Leah, thanks for waiting on me while I babble on. Hi. What's going on with you? <laughs> well, um, first of all, I want to say that you are one of my atheist heroes. Whatever. And, um, but you're very I, kind. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think there's one video of yours that I have not seen. So I look forward to the new ones all the time. Thank you. Um, I am one of the very few um, members of my family that is atheist. Um I have an uncle that came out to me just this year when I was having trouble um, struggling um, with my atheism and and uh, on Facebook and um, and he has actually come to my rescue and and uh, so it's it's really um, a good feeling to know that you're not alone and uh, so he's an unbeliever as well he. Yes, totally walked and, away from religion. Yes, he's uh, he's in his. I want to say he's in his fifties. He he knew he was an atheist in his early twenties, and even as uh, um, when I was young, he wanted so much to um, tell me things and and educate me, and he felt it wasn't his place. So, um, so that was really. He's my favorite uncle too. So that was really heartwarming. Um, and I am proud to say that I am raising a free thinking child. He's 14 and I gave him the choice and I think he chose the right side. So, um, so you're teaching them how to think and not necessarily what to think. That's amazing. Yes, That's and, awesome. And it's, and it's more than just, um, that, but life in general, um, don't take anything for face value, do your own research, do your own homework, um, you know, fact, evidence, everything and he's learning so, you are you are now um, officially my hero i love oh. free thinking parents i love it and what what they are doing now and the, and the skills that they are training uh, their children with today i mean teaching the the skills of how to approach a situation objectively as objectively as you can and figure it out for yourself is awesome so that's right because i didn't have that growing up so um, it's very important to me to teach that to my child. But anyway, um, what I wanted to say was, um, you know, with a believing family, the majority of my family, I try to look at holidays and even just um, family gatherings um, where, you know, you make it out to be what you want it to be. What is it to you? Um, and and don't worry about, you know, the God stuff or, you know, the praying. Um, you know, I've held, I've been part of the prayer circle. Um, I hold the hand, but I don't close my eyes. I don't bow my head and I don't say amen. But you have to look at it this way. You're still part of that family. And it's not worth to make a fuss about it, whether they know you're atheist or not. Um, it's just not worth it. And I'm not there to break hearts. I'm there to just be a part of it. And you can make it out to be what you want it to be. And it's about family and giving and, you know, being thankful on Thanksgiving. And, you know, it's, it's up to you. You said it better so. than I ever could. That's good stuff. Oh. And, and I think we all have things in our lives that are special to us, things that we'd like to do with the holiday, things that will make it unique to us and our own, you know, our own, uh, the people in our life that mean the most to us. Yeah. Why not? Why not put your own signature on it, make it what it, it can be for you and enjoy it. So. It's not worth the stress and the anxiety. It really isn't. You have to look at what's more important. 
Well said. Um, well said. Well, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving and thank you for the kind words. It means a whole lot. Thank you, Seth. All right. Take care. You too. Bye. Austin Klein had an article on this very subject on about.com. Godless Thanksgiving. Do atheists have anyone to thank? <laughs> uh, what a great headline. Of course we do. I'll just read you some of the highlights because I thought it was a good article. And I, I subscribe to uh, to Austin's uh, newsletter. It comes in, I'm going to say it's like once a week. And, and he's got some good material out there. And so I encourage you to check it out. His name is Austin Klein, C-L-I-N-E. His per first paragraph, rather, it says, There's a popular belief among some American Christians that the American Thanksgiving holiday is necessarily religious. Aside from the apparent desire to turn everything into an expression of their religion, the primary reason behind this seems to be the idea that the whole point must be to give thanks to their God. Not any other gods, just theirs, thus making it a Christian holiday, too. If this is true, then it makes no sense for non-Christians, or at least non-theists, to celebrate Thanksgiving. Well, godless Americans celebrate Thanksgiving. It's undeniable that non-Christians and non-theists all over America participate in Thanksgiving observances. This proves the insistence on the religious or Christian nature of Thanksgiving is false. It simply can't be true. But this doesn't tell us why it isn't true. For that it must be shown that giving thanks to God is unnecessary or senseless, and that there are others to whom we can give thanks to, or preferably all three. And he lists some bullets down here, and I'll just kind of go and, and give you the, the highlight, really. So we should give thanks to people. There are many people whom we should thank because of how they help us either live at all or just live better. A common thread in these cases is precisely the fact that it is humans who are responsible for that which we should be thankful. So it is humans whom we should be thanking. Next point, giving thanks to farmers. Perhaps the most obvious humans to whom we might give thanks when we eat would be the farmers responsible for providing us with the food we eat. Although massive corporations have taken over significant aspects of food production and distribution, small farmers continue to play an important role in growing, raising, and providing what we eat every day. Most people are far removed from food production and forget what's involved. Maybe Thanksgiving's a good day to stop and think about this. Next bullet says, give thanks to the soldiers and veterans. I love this one, by the way. And I know some people use this as a soap soapbox to go off on governments. I, I'm not talking about that. The people, the men and women of the armed forces, you betcha. Austin's article says, Also commonly forgotten are the sacrifices made by those in our military, even those who never fight in any wars, still sacrifice several years of their lives in order to be a part of an organization which keeps America free. And this, of course, applies to other nations. The government has too often misused the American military, but disagreements about policy should not cause people to forget what our military personnel have done for us. Thank you, Austin. And thank you to our men and women in the armed forces. Giving thanks to doctors in modern medicine. Great one. It's difficult to comprehend how devastating diseases were in the recent past. It's only been in the past few decades doctors have been able to treat infections and other conditions reliably and consistently. Most of the medicine we take for granted is of recent vintage and medical research is helping make more and more conditions treatable if not curable. Giving thanks to engineers and modern technology. The technology we have today, much of which was barely imaginable less than a century ago, has both saved lives and improved the way we live. Lives are saved via medical technology, safety devices, and better protection from the elements. Our lives are enriched by things like the internet, easier travel, and new ways to create art. That's a great point, by the way. If you were traveling to see Grandma, you know... A hundred years ago, you're, you know, you ain't hopping on uh, express jet. You, you know what I'm saying? We do take it for granted. We bitch and moan about the airport, but the truth is, is it's, it is pretty amazing. Giving thanks to science and scientists. One of the defining features of our modern world is science, but too often basic science is overshadowed by the bright glow of what science produces. 
Science has been instrumental in improving what farmers can grow, what the military can accomplish, what doctors can treat, and what engineers can build. Science and scientists are the ones who have helped make our world more understandable and hence have improved our ability to live in it. Next bullet says, giving thanks to friends and family. Those listed above are usually distant from us and easy to forget, but thus making it important to stop to think of them. But we should not forget those who are closest to us and who are easiest to take for granted. No person is an island. Who we are is dependent upon those around us, and we should stop to give thanks to friends and family who help us, support us, and generally make life worth living for us. And that's a great caveat. Friends and family who... Help us, support us, and make life worth living. (laughs) Again, I do not subscribe to the notion that anybody who is on your immediate family tree gets a pass. Boundaries. His final point says this. Gods are irrelevant, and thanking gods is insulting. Sports players should thank parents coaches and teammates who helped them develop their skills and thus made their victories possible. Accident survivors should thank the engineers who designed vehicles to help people survive accidents. Parents of sick children should thank medical personnel who spend hours using skills developed over a lifetime. Thanking irrelevant gods is an insult to the people responsible for what happens to us. It says that all the time, effort, blood, sweat, and tears we expend in improving ourselves and in improving the lives of those around us are ultimately wasted because the outcome will be determined by God, regardless of what we do. Whether for good or for ill, though, our fates lie in our hands. I'll link to the article in the description box of this show, but it's by Austin Klein at about.com, and it says it's called Godless Thanksgiving. Do atheists have anyone to thank? I think ultimately, I want you to have a stress-free holiday. I mean, I don't know if you care what I want, but I I want for you a stress-free event. This is supposed to be a positive time, and I see so many people get get. They just coil up like a spring with stress. They are so overwhelmed with how many houses do we have to visit and and how long do we have to stay and what if so-and-so says this and how am I going to get all the food prepared and how many gifts are we going to buy? And, and they find themselves robbing, they rob themselves of the opportunity to have some real joy. In my own life, we simplified. We, you know, Natalie and I, we just paired back. We spend time with our family, yeah, but I mean, I don't, we don't live the holidays out of obligation. Life is too short. We find the things we're truly thankful for. I'm truly thankful for you. I'm thankful that you listen. I'm thankful that you put up with me. I'm, I'm thankful that, that you are a force in my life that I, I could not replace at this point. I, I don't know what I would do if I did not have this community. It's true. Sounds kind of corny. I I don't know what I would do. You know, you've you've connected me. And you've supported me and and you've made me better. You've challenged me. When I get something wrong, you challenge me to make it right. When I have a disagreement, you challenge me to check my own worldview and and try to come back and, you know, to see if it if it holds water. You make me laugh. You, you, you make my day. I'm thankful for the people who support the thinking atheist. I'm thankful for Meg, who helps me administer. She, she's co-admin of the page and is, at this point, nearly indispensable. Whip smart and an amazing part of the thinking atheist. James on the forum. That guy has literally managed the forum for years because he loves it. And he's been absolutely fantastic. Doesn't get near the recognition he deserves. Tom and Marco on the website. None of that would have been possible had it not been for them. I'm thankful for all the sacrifices and the time. The people who've contributed to the videos that I produce. The people who call the radio shows. Thank you. I don't say it enough. Why not on Thanksgiving? Thank you. You are amazing and i'm tremendously grateful that you're a part of my life okay so group hug 
Uh, coming up next week, we're going to have a ball. We're going to talk about Christmas and how most of it has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. It's going to be an awesome show. In the meantime, I hope the long holiday weekend is wonderful for you and yours. Be safe. And I'll see you next time on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Follow the Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com